Welcome and good morning. Good morning. I'm Laurel Seppla Etra, and I'm delighted to be your worship leader this morning. One thing I love about this church and congregation is looking out the sanctuary window and seeing our beautiful grove of trees. I want to extend a very warm welcome to everyone who's visiting us for the first time. We are an intentional community gathered around our shared promise to support each other's individual spiritual journeys. We don't all believe the same things in exactly the same way, but we do share the same values and the same commitment to our spiritual growth. We share the faith that our beliefs become real when we act on them to make the world better. And we share the commitment to live a life grounded in community. If you're joining us online, fill out a visitor form in the link in the description. We'd love to connect with you. I have some announcements. Next Sunday is our Earth Day service, followed by a delicious vegetarian lunch sponsored by the Climate Action Team. All are welcome, and we are seeking volunteers to help with lunch. Sign up with Jim Dimmick at the Climate Action Table after the service. Last Sunday, power outages kept us from welcoming back Reverend Kelly Dingnan, our former minister and current co-director of the Unitarian Universalist Ministry for the Earth. But good news that Reverend Kelly was able to reschedule and will lead services here on April 28th. <laughs> Finally, our Pledge Drive co-chairs have an announcement. So we're here to um, share the joy of declaring victory. We are currently at 97% of our goal budget, uh, having, having commitments of $417,000. And there are probably enough outstanding that they'll dribble in and we'll hit our goal, um, just allowing time for that. So I just want to put it in context. This is a, a flow. This is a three-year process. It's, it's culminating in this pledge drive. There was a very strong act of faith during the pandemic. Do you remember having to have faith in the pandemic? Nobody <laughs> knew what the future was gonna be. Well, the board looked ahead and said, we're not gonna shrink, we're not gonna contract. We're gonna go ahead and fund out of um, reserves. And they did that in a huge manner in 2020 and then tapered off a little bit. But the goal this year was to try and get us back to a balanced budget and we're there. So. Thank you all. You, you too participate in that act of faith, and that's what brought us here today. So growing our future is the theme, and you all know since last November we have voted to grow. And so it's very important that we reach this plateau and this stable base because there will be more coming over the next couple of years as we try and grow our space and accommodate more people more comfortably um, each Sunday. So I had the extreme pleasure of working in partnership with Sharma Rockstar, who also was co-chair last year. So she brought last year's cumulative knowledge and, and program and everything else, uh, and I joined in. So I want to give her a chance to express her appreciation and gratitude as well. Thank you, uh, thank you all for stepping up for the pledge drive, um, really, really appreciate it. I wanna extend my thank you to the amazing people at this church that put in processes in place that work. So we were standing on what folks did last year and the wheel before, right, Whitney Wheelers and Jennifer Skandilowski who put together this amazing process uh, to, that helped us succeed. And the other thing that was very helpful for us is 17 pledge stewards mm -hmm. contacting you, sending emails, being grateful, you know, broadcasting their message to our congregation. And that's what made us succeed. It's amazing people that put together amazing processes and then our members that reach out to you 
and help you step up to make your pledge. So I just wanted to thank you all for stepping up and thank you all for helping with the pledge drive. And if you want to learn about amazing practices, step up next year <laughs> and join in. Because there's a lot to learn and it's fun. Well, one special thanks we wanted to give is to Fred Cole for stepping in uh, in a, a huge administrative help during, during our time when our office staff was short. So thank you so much, Fred, for all your expertise. <laughs> I like that we're not weird about money in this congregation. <laughs> that we're not like avoidant and hush hush about it and we're also not like guilty and shameful about it. it. There's just a pragmatic reality and everyone pitching in together can do remarkable things. I'm grateful for that. I have an invitation also. After the service today at 1230, our membership coordinator, Irene and I, lead a Finding Yourself at UUCB class. It's an opportunity for newer folks in the community to get a more of a sense of what we are about and where did we come from and where are we going and how might you get more involved? How might you find your small community within this big community? With three different people this week, I happen to get into conversations about what we're trying to do here as a community. There are almost 30 new members, new official members, who have joined in this current year. And that's unusual in a time when a lot of churches are struggling, a lot of communities. But in each of these conversations, I try to tell people the same thing that we say among ourselves as a staff team, the same thing that we say on the membership and connection committee, that the <coughs> point is not to grow. The point is not that that number is the most important thing. The point is belonging and connection. The point is relationship. The point, the measure of success is doing the best possible job actually inviting each other into this shared journey in real relationship with each other. That sort of work is, is growth, but it's heart growth spirit growth, it's living your values into reality in the world and connecting something to bigger than any of us, connecting together. Really that invitation, the work, is into a sort of orientation, a, a way of going about living. And my friend and colleague, the Reverend Karen Herring, tells me this story, <coughs> talked about this from the time she was working as a hospital chaplain, she says, the first time I saw the phrase oriented times three, I was working in a hospital as a chaplain. And the phrase was frequently used in patient charts. And at first I thought it might be shorthand for an extremely oriented patient. <laughs> oriented to the third power, aware, sharp, quick, responsive, cognizant of what's going on inside her. Karen says, a nurse explained to me that the phrase refers to being oriented to person, place, and time. It's a determination commonly made by asking patients, what's your name? Do you know where you are? Do you know what day it is? And I began to wonder if we might ask similar questions to determine if a person is spiritually oriented. What would it mean to be spiritually oriented times three? <laughs> what questions might we ask? What is your name? Do you know who you are? Do you know whose you are? Do you know where you are? What is your place in the world, in your life, in your relationships? What day is it today? What time is it in your life? What time is it for? What are you living for? Today, tomorrow, yesterday? Karen says, these are not unrelated to other questions I ask all the time in hospital rooms, in the pulpit on Sunday, in long nights when I'm alone. What do I believe? Where do I belong? What does it all mean? Certainly. 
Certainly, I know the questions better than the answers. But I also know this, we have spiritual compasses inside us that help us each arrive at our own answers. Sometimes we can read our compasses more easily than others, but we all have something that spins towards north, this inner tug toward the holy. And in those times when our compass is impossible to find or to read, we can turn to one another or to maps that help us get oriented, constellations that guide us where we're headed. Perhaps this is what it means to be spiritually oriented times three, oriented to self, oriented to others, oriented to the holy. Perhaps that's what we're doing here together, reading our compasses, finding our way in a universe of shining stars and making new maps to help one another on that journey. Each week in the service, we make a recommitment to each other and to ourselves about what we're doing, a covenant, which is a sort of old fashioned word for a reminder or a promise about what the work is that we're all here to do together. To covenant is to commit that even when we fall short of our aspirations as individuals, as a community, we don't let go of that compass heading, that thing that shows the way, that tugs towards north. We just pick ourselves up and try again. In that spirit, gathered in person and online, can I invite you to rise as you're able? And we'll all speak our covenant. Hold hands or put a hand on your heart if you'd rather not. We gather in fellowship to speak truth to each other, to reach out and touch one another, to care with each other, and to seek the truth divine. So be it. And we'll remain standing and join in singing. Our opening hymn this morning is number 83 in your gray hymnal. Winds be still, and if you don't like reading music, the words will be on the screen. once, I read once,
tell you a story about a woman named Barbara who left her home in the desert in Arizona and went on vacation to an island in the Caribbean and brought home some shells to show her daughter. And her daughter set the shells out to sort them and to look, except the largest shell of all started to move. <laughs> and one long red claw-like talon extended itself and started tapping around, and then five more legs and two eyes sticking up on stalks. They brought home a hermit crab by mistake who promptly started walking around the table, exploring their new home. Barbara named it Buster, which I think is a good hermit crab name, and got a terrarium with clean gravel and a cactus from the yard and a bowl of fresh water and mostly fed it leftovers from the fridge. The hermit crab loved it. They gave him a whole bunch of different shells. He'd try them on. Some days, Buster would be so still he seemed dead. And some days he would rearrange everything in his tank and turn over rocks and dig up the cactus and flip it over and drag around the old pork chop bones. <laughs> they try to figure out what this cycle was. Why some days and not others. And it didn't seem to correlate to anything they could figure out. Until Barbara remembered something she'd read years years before about a scientist called Frank Brown who moved from living next to the ocean in Connecticut to living far from the ocean in Chicago. Frank studied oysters. Oysters stay closed up in their shells until the tide changes and it brings fresh water and then they, they open and sort of stick out their little oyster mouths and eat the food that's floating by. Frank wanted to know how do oysters know when to feed if they're not in the ocean feeling the tide moving over them? Tide rises and falls in the Atlantic, but in Chicago, in a tank with no tide, how does an oyster decide when to eat? The oysters did a funny thing. After two weeks in the Midwest, altogether they adopted a new schedule. They all opened their mouths and closed them at the same time, but it did not correspond to the time high tide came to Connecticut or any other ocean in the world. Instead, they were feeding at just about the time high tide would come to Chicago, <coughs> if Chicago had an ocean next to it. They lived in glass tanks in the basement of Northwestern University, Rachel, who was at Northwestern, told me she thinks she knows this building, and the basement is way down below ground where there's no light or windows. But just like the tide, these oysters were answering the moon, unseen though it might be. Why would Buster the hermit crab run around at some times and not others? Maybe. It was high tide out there in the desert, a thousand miles from any ocean. Maybe Buster the hermit crab, just like us, feels themselves part of this vast and interdependent web of life and of the world, feels the tug of forces no matter where you go. The chalice is the symbol of our liberal faith. It is the warmth of compassion, the fire of justice, a lamp on the spiritual path. If you're joining us online and have a chalice nearby, please get ready to light it with us. I'd like to invite Robin Miller to light this morning's chalice. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Robin Miller, and I have been coming to UCB for about eight years. I have three objectives during this chalice lighting. 
to share some things about myself so that you get to know me better, to let you know how this community has changed me, and to relate it to the service or monthly topic. Well, <laughs> the service topic is wonder as it relates to the eclipse. And I'm all for celestial inspiration, but the only thing that came to me was, I wonder, 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 wonder who, who, who wrote the book of love? <laughs> While this is not quite on point, it gives you some insight into the strange workings of my mind. So, fun fact about me, I think in song lyrics. My high school best friend says, bursting into song unbidden is my superpower. And my 14-year-old daughter snarks that it is my fatal flaw. <laughs> I will now try to restrain myself for the rest of my chalice lighting. No promises. From an early age, both in my upbringing in central New Jersey and through the culture at large, independence, individuality, and self-reliance were mantras and a lifestyle. I was taught that I could think and plan and work and I'd never be taken unawares or be unlucky, or gasp, tardy. <laughs> what this instilled in me was the idea that I was individually responsible for everything. If I wanted good grades, I had to study by myself because those other lackeys weren't really serious. <laughs> if I was smart, I'd focus on jobs where my hard work and persistence would move me onward and upward. Regarding work experience, I have been a babysitter, shelf stalker, butcher cleaner, waitress, and a wedding singer. Also, I have been a United States Marine, an operations manager of Union Telecom installers, a management consultant, a ceramic artist, and a serial volunteer. <laughs> I've been everywhere, man, I've been everywhere. Most, if not all, of these occupations have been me doing my work alone. I was an independent, self-reliant individual who was doing really well professionally, but not so much emotionally. This led to my thinking that it was me against the world, and that is a lonely and unsustainable place. I was not in the best headspace when we moved to Boulder nine years ago. I had major anxiety about climate change, racism, political polarism, gun violence, and my own inability to affect any positive change. Then UUCB happened. I became more involved with different groups at UUCB. When I was perplexed about how to introduce spirituality to my small daughter, I approached the religious education community. When I was grappling with big questions about humanity, politics, racism, sexism, or war, inevitably, we'd be discussing the subject with the Friday afternoon book club. When I needed to work through life-changing decisions or old history that was still holding me back, my covenant groups, through deep listening, formed a community of trust where I could organize and crystallize my thinking. When I'm at my wit's end dealing with my young teen, the women in women's spirituality are empathetic, suggest books I can read, <laughs> and tell me it's just a normal part of her development, you'll get through this. When I feel hopeless in the face of the huge problems of racial injustice or climate change, both the racial justice and climate action ministries are there to give me ideas of how I can make strides forward within a community. When I find myself in times of trouble, <laughs> I'm slowly realizing that it is not my sole responsibility to fix everything. In fact, there are a lot of people in this very community who are all working together collectively to find solutions and act on the big problems. Plus, it's way more fun to work with other fabulous like-minded people. In this community, I've started to feel more hopeful for the future and humankind. So in the spirit of interdependence, 
which is the monthly theme. Check, third objective. I light this chalice. <clears throat> Join me in a spirit of prayer and meditation. Sometimes I say those words and, and worry about giving the wrong impression, as if a spirit of prayer and meditation is the singular thing that everyone is supposed to do exactly the same right way. I think what it really means, join in a spirit of prayer or meditation, it is it's this internal sense of slowing down. It's not about what it looks like on the outside, but it's, it's this moment to pause, to take a deep breath, and to come back to yourself again. I think it's, it's an invitation maybe to a certain kind of gentleness. We have to move through the world so often protected and defended, guard up, walls up. And it's an invitation just on the inside, just in this moment, not perfectly and completely, but incrementally, to soften, to gentle towards yourself, to take a breath and listen to what is on your heart, your mind, your spirit. Our words for meditation are by the poet Elsa Bell, called On the Day of the Eclipse. Let the carpenter turn from the nail. Let the boater lift his sunglasses. The teacher settle the children on the grass. Let the farmer kill the engines of the plow and the minister unbow from prayers. The cars slip onto the shoulder, the drivers roll down the window and wait. The offices spill people onto the sidewalk. Let the dogs whine and trot inside. The drowsy bees zip to their box, the cows sink in the meadow. Let the owls and bats and crickets out Good night, good night, sun, good night, strange night, sparkling. Let us think of the ancients pointing to the sun being swallowed by a serpent, a hole in the sky. They stopped a war to stare and make a fearful peace. A restlessness, superstition even, twinges in us. The moon curtain draws, the light dims like old film. The air cools, shadows thin to ribbons, waving like hair underwater. And the crescent sun extends long horns. Oh, how we have forgotten all that's in the sky. The otherworldly, the unearthly, the grand and marvelous. Let the moon ring the sun. Let us celebrate this deep night in the midst of an otherwise ordinary day. Let us pause. Let us look up. We'll be together in silence for a few moments. Hope and our prayer this morning is that simple. In the midst of an otherwise 
ordinary day, may we pause, may we look up. Part of the work we do, part of the practice we do, is about rejoicing when other people are joyful and about feeling grief when other people are sad. It's about making the care, the conditions of others our own, about feeling that. And we do this in ritual, this outward expression of an inward movement. We place stones to symbolize the joys or the sorrows. And in doing that, it, you're, you're practicing. You're teaching yourself. You're learning over and over again that hope and suffering is woven daily into our living, not measured against each other in balance, but both apart. And we are people who recognize the beauty and the tragedy which fills this world. So in just a moment, for those of us here, I'll invite you to come forward as you feel moved. We'll start with the back half of the room by the windows and then folks in front. Take a stone and feel the weight of it. Feel your body warm it and let it be an emblem of thankfulness or worry or both and then put it in the company of everyone else. This morning we hold in love Sam Henderson, our administrator, back in the office again. <laughs> Sam and their spouse Caitlin are going through major life changes. And finances are difficult, and they say keep us in your thoughts. Send us good vibes, says Sam. We hold in love and worry the situation in the Middle East. May cooler heads prevail, and may we not lose hope that peace, that justice is possible. Jack and Kay Doggett share their joy that their daughter, Lindsay, came through open heart surgery this week and worry for the long recovery ahead. And Hilton shares an uncomplicated joy. Congratulations to DU Hockey winning the NBCAA <laughs> National Championship. <laughs> For all of our hopes and joys and all of our grief, simple and complicated, may we hold this compassionate space with love. Please come forward. I am 
sending you light to hold you, to heal you. I am sending you light to hold you in love. No matter what you feel or what you choose, to show we are always there for you and we want you to know that we are sending you light to hold you to heal you we are sending <coughs> sending you light to hold you, to heal you. We are sending you light to hold you in love. We walk the path with you. Go slow, dear one. Don't hurry, we'll go just like you need to go. There is no need to worry. We are sending you light to hold you, to heal you. We are sending you light to hold you in love. We are sending you light <coughs> to hold you, to heal you. We are sending you light to hold you.
the sky's blue was deepening, but there was no darkness. The sun was a wide crescent, like a segment of tangerine. This is the writer Annie Dillard describing an eclipse a half century ago. The wind freshened and blew steadily over the hill. The eastern hill across the highway grew dusky and sharp. The towns and orchards in the valley to the south were dissolving into the blue light. Only a thin band of river held a spot of sun. Now the sky to the west deepened to indigo, a color never seen. A dark sky usually loses color. This was saturated, deep indigo, up into the air. I turned back to the sun. It was going. I saw a circular piece of sky that appeared suddenly detached, blackened, and backlighted. From nowhere it came and overlapped the sun. It did not look like the moon. It was enormous and black. It looked like a lens cover or the lid of a pot. It materialized out of thin air, black and flat and sliding, outlined in flame. She goes on to say, seeing this Blackness was like seeing a mushroom cloud. The meaning of the sight overwhelmed its fascination. It obliterated meaning itself. For what is significance? It is significance for people. No people, no significance. This is all I have to tell you. In the deeps are the violence and terror of which psychology has warned us. But if you ride these monsters deeper down, if you drop with them farther over the world's rim, you find what our sciences cannot locate or name the substrate, the ocean or matrix or ether that buoys the rest, that gives goodness its power for good and evil its power for evil. The unified field, our complex, and inexplicable caring for each other and for our life together here. This is given. It is not learned. The world which lay under darkness and stillness after the closing of the lid was not the world we know. Last week, when the wind was blowing 100 mile an hour gusts, and many, most of you, this building didn't have power, I was in Indianapolis. <laughs> we went out there, my folks met up with us in the path of totality for the eclipse. We were in a quiet little neighborhood east of downtown. I don't know the city well. We made our way out through these houses set so close together. I'm used now to living in the West. It looked so Eastern to me back there. <laughs> Tiny little sidewalks. We made our way through the neighborhood to a school. All the schools were closed for the day. And set out the folding chairs we'd brought with us in this bitter afternoon heat and put on our eclipse glasses and watched and waited watched as the quality of the light changed, the color of the light changes, grayer, bluer, steely, like an old photograph. Watched as the shadows got sharper, because instead of all the parts of the sun casting down, this sort of fuzzy outline, there was just that one sliver, and the sun shines like a spotlight, and everything is crisp and dim. We felt the change as the air got cooler and cooler. And then when that moment of totality came, there's a suddenness to it. For all the anticipation, there is a suddenness that all at once, it's dark. And sunset, instead of on one horizon, is all around you, on every horizon around you, sunset in every direction. But what I remember most of all 
is the sound. The sound. Not just the birdsong sound. In this little park where we were behind the school, there was a half dozen or ten people over there a little way, a family, parents. And over on the playground equipment, there were another eight or ten people. And what I remember is the sound in that moment of totality that escaped from every one of us, laughter and shouting and cheering. We clapped for the eclipse. <laughs> Spontaneously, not because we expected a response, but there was something in us that came out at that moment. And some of the kids who had been running around stood very still, and some of the kids who had been standing very still were running around. In 2017, we were living in Chicago and drove down, and I saw the eclipse outside St. Louis, and I remember then laughing uncontrollably that amazed, helpless laughter that just falls out of you in astonishment. Mm. The world which lay under darkness and stillness after the closing of the lid was not the world we know. It was a world of astonishment. An interviewer years ago asked the astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, what is the most astounding fact you can share about the universe. And he said, with the sort of absolute 100% enthusiasm this man seems to have for everything, he says, the very <laughs> molecules that make up your body, the atoms that construct the molecules, are traceable to the centers of high mass stars that exploded their chemically rich guts across the galaxy, that enriched pristine gas clouds, hydrogen, helium, with chemistry of life. So that we're all connected to each other biologically, we're connected to this earth chemically, we are connected to the rest of the universe atomically. He says, when I look up at the night sky, I know that we're part of this universe, we're in this universe, but perhaps more important, this universe is in us. I look up, many people feel small because they are small and the universe is big. But I feel big because my atoms came from those stars. That's being oriented to the vertical dimension of life. To remain attuned in wonder to the immensity of this world, this universe. To remember at once how small we are and that we are star stuff shining to each other. It is at once the most astounding fact and wildly easy to forget. The day after the 2017 eclipse, the satirical newspaper, The Onion, published a news report titled, Sky Normal Today. <laughs> Dateline, Washington. Informing citizens there really wasn't anything special going on up there. The nation's scientists confirmed the sky is normal today. You know, just normal sky stuff. For the time being, there's no real reason to look up. <laughs> Which is top-notch satire, because on the one hand, that is totally ridiculous. And on the other hand, this is, in fact, how we move through life most of the time. Not much to look up for. And out of tune, out of touch with that vertical dimension, that wonder axis that runs through us. Most of life is not peak experience of intuited mystical connection with the universe. Most of life is dishes <laughs> and <laughs> laundry and parenting. <coughs> we forget this stuff. We forget that when totality arrived, the night is visible during the day and just for a few moments, instead of looking out into the galaxy, out into the universe, you look right towards the center across our solar system, into it. And there, on either side of the sun, was Jupiter and Venus. And you could realize 
that we are sitting on a world with a tilted axis in the plane of this solar system connected to something big there. I know that diagram probably from before I can talk, seeing pictures of it, little nice neat rings printed on a page. To feel that is entirely different. One of the sources, the grounding, the inspiration of this living tradition we practice is direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of spirit, to an openness to the forces that create and uphold life. Each of us a bit of the universe, looking back at itself. Direct experience of transcending mystery and wonder and the guidance of reason and results of science eclipses both. There's room and space to think and understand and there is the experience that resists understanding. Perhaps that's what it means to be spiritually oriented, times three, oriented to self and others, and oriented to the holy. Perhaps that's what we're doing here, says Karen Herring. Reading our compasses, finding our way in a universe of shining stars, making maps to help each other. We're in this house remembering who we are and whose we are, remembering the most astounding facts about the universe, because for all that amazement, we forget them so quick. When we gather in song and in silence, when we make a landscape of our joys and sorrows, we're practicing, we're remembering again the day blind stars that are always there, but we don't always see. On the day of the eclipse, writes the poet Elsa Bell, let the carpenter turn from the nail. Let the teacher settle the children on the grass. Let the farmer kill the plow's engine. The minister unbow from prayer. The cars slip onto the shoulder. The drivers <coughs> roll down the window and wait. Let us pause, let us look up, let that be our work today and as often as we can, amen. Let's join together in singing. We rise in body or spirit, we'll sing together 1068. Let's take that feeling into song. <laughs>
This month, our offering goes to SPAN, Safe House Progressive Alliance for Nonviolence. I invite Mary Deneen to come up and tell us about the organization. I have been a member here at UUCB for 25 years, and during that time, I have also been involved with SPAN. When Safe House Progressive Alliance for Nonviolence, known as SPAN, first opened its doors to the community in 1979, it was difficult to envision the significant impact the program would have on the lives of so many women and children through our community. In 45 years, SPAN has evolved and continues to evolve with not only the commitment and determination of SPAN's teams, but with the help and passion of the community support. Who is SPAN and what do we do? SPAN is a human rights organization committed to ending violence against adults, youth, and children. It is the only organization serving Boulder and Broomfield County. SPAN offers support and services that provide healing, hope, and opportunity to adults, youth, and children who have been impacted by domestic or dating violence, and they are seeking resources or information or questioning unhealthy aspects of their relationships. In 2023, SPAN touched more than 11,800 lives right here in Boulder and Broomfield County, including responding to 10,077 crisis hotline calls, providing emergency shelter to 230 adults and 146 children, supporting 377 individuals with immediate support after law enforcement involvement and legal advocacy, supporting 702 adults and children with counseling services and providing intensive transitional services, including long-term housing to support 359 individuals and their families. That's a lot of people right here. <laughs> From crisis intervention to shelter, legal advocacy and outreach counseling services, SPAN provides survivors of domestic violence with the support and services they need to offer safety, hope, and healing. I invite you to give as generously as you are able. For those online, you can use the QR code or find a link in the video description. For those gathered in person, you can scan the QR code or make a donation as the ushers now pass the baskets. May our gifts be used to enact justice, bringing peace and love to the Boulder community.
What do I believe? Where do I belong? What does it all mean? Am I oriented to myself, to everyone around me? Am I oriented to a direction of wonder? Certainly, I know the questions better than the answers. Oh, sweet, radiant mystery, set us free. Amen. We rise in body or in spirit. Let's close together in song. Two, uh, two brief announcements before we sing our benediction. First, we're so grateful to Carmen Sandim for sharing her musical gifts with piano today. <laughs> Second, you are beautifully disciplined about putting your hymnals away at the end of the Sunday service, but since we're experimenting with using them every week, would you please not do that today <laughs> and just leave them where they are? Um, I failed to provide sheet music for this musical response to our guest pianist today, and so we'll just sing it together. Yeah. <laughs> Go your way in peace.